Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen and children and boys and girls and everyone tuning in to the Baha'i Blogcast, thank you so much, our guest this week, this week, this month, I don't know what it is, our guest on this particular podcast is Billy Roberts, infamous Baha'i of legend, of note, he is a PhD, apparently, in psychology, is that right? That's right, it's a, it's, it's a doctoral degree in counseling, clinical counseling psychology. Which I would love to talk to you about, your counseling days and your psychology days, being a big fan of the field of psychology, but Billy has served the faith in so many different capacities, and as well as the uh, Continental Board and Auxiliary Board Member and National Spiritual Assembly and Pioneer, and we'll get to all of that, but also the founder of the Black Men's Gathering, which had a fantastic history. I'd, I'd like to start at the very beginning, Billy. How did you become a Baha'i? How did you hear about the Baha'i faith? Well, uh, you know, I am... Uh, the oldest of eight children, and my mother was married to a man whose name was John Welch, who was a quite an extraordinary guy. He was my stepfather. Uh, after a lot of suffering, she finally met a guy, this guy of her dreams, and very sadly, he passed suddenly, hmm. which threw our family into a tremendous uh, dither, you know? Hmm. Uh, it was very hard for my mom, and... Uh, so for a period of time, each one of us were detailed to a relative's house while she sort of pulled herself together. Mm. I was sent to an uncle who lived in California, her oldest, my mother's oldest brother. And, uh, uh, and I went and lived there and, and went to high school there because I was 15 years old. And I uh, heard about the faith um, in a math class. Uh, the teacher came in, I'll never forget it, his name was Mr. Winitzer, decided he was going to give us a pop quiz. And none of us were ready. We were, you know, in those days we were seated alphabetically. Behind me was a guy named Fred White. Some of you may know Fred. Fred pulled out a blue leather book and was reading feverishly. And I looked around and I said, man, what are you doing? And he said, he's giving us a quiz and I'm not ready. I'm saying my prayers. So I took the book and I looked at it. I saw gold lettering on the front. I wasn't particularly interested. We took the exam. I don't know if any of us passed. I can't remember. Later, he said to me, uh, would you be interested in knowing about Baha'i? And uh, I said, what is it? He said, it's my religion. I said, no, thank you. Mm. But I never forget that Fred had the courage to mention the faith to me. And later, when I, some years later, when I was with the university, I bumped into the Baha'i faith. There was a student who lived in our development, our area of campus, and uh, he was always going off with these people. And at that time, we were a group of about 30 black students, the first or second large contingent of black students ever to be at the university. And he was going off with these white people into the darkness. You remember, I was from the city, and we were out in a rural campus, and I kept saying to him, you know, you got to be careful. Those people may bury you in a cornfield out here. <laughs> and his position was, yes, I'm a Baha'i, and I believe in the oneness of mankind. These are my friends. So I decided I would look into it, really to find out what this is all about, because out of a sense of concern for him. <laughs> and I started studying and going to Baha'i meetings and to firesides and fell in love with the faith. Uh, and those people who were, will remember the firesides I went to will say, will tell you how, what a challenging student I was. Because hmm. I would ask them very difficult questions. But what impressed me more than anything else was that those people who didn't have the answers would say, I don't know, but I'll find out. Wow. And they always did. 
Mm. And uh, that that really impressed me. So I fell in love with the faith and became a Baha'i myself. So that's my little story. What a great lesson, that last part that you mentioned about not needing to know everything. I think sometimes we feel as Baha'is in teaching the faith, like we have to have all the answers just right at our beck and call and how powerful it is to say, I don't know, you bring up a really good point. Yeah, and I'll I'll go and find out. And I'll, bring I'll research the answer back. It. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and then follow through. You know, so now that was 1970. Is that correct? That was in 1970. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's such an exciting time. And I I wrote a little essay, uh, which I read here on this podcast about um, you know the late 60s and early 70s and how exciting, what an incredible energy there was, not just in the Baha'i community, but in America, and people were on a political quest and a, a spiritual quest and a psychological quest and searching for meaning, and the world was being turned inside out, um, but there were so many open souls and open hearts, and you know, tens of thousands of people became Baha'is during that time. Can you talk a little bit about that time period? Well, I think I was very fortunate in that I was a student at the University of Massachusetts, and there was quite a contingent, quite a large number of individuals, both students, undergraduate students, graduate students, as well as faculty, who were at that particular university. And uh, we had a tremendously uh, effective and active Baha'i Association. I happened to have the opportunity to be the chair of that association uh, at a certain point. Uh, And uh, it really was um, a a time when there was uh, much interest and enthusiasm about the the Baha'i faith, as well as about social problems and social issues in the in the world, and uh, uh, and there was a great bonding, and uh, and from that array of huge array of people, um, if you remember, the House of Justice was calling for a lot of people to go pioneering during that time, uh, and that was the nine year plan, and uh, uh, so a lot of those people literally went out and are all over the world serving. Mm. And, uh, and those people who didn't necessarily go out are serving in this country. And mm. uh, and it was just a sort of imperative that if you were a Baha'i, then the expectation was that you would serve. You would really devote yourself and your life to serving Baha'u'llah and serving the faith. And so I really feel very grateful. And I can mention numbers of people who were uh, around during that time, and everyone had an influence on one another, you know? And mm-hmm. it was really a very, very special experience and opportunity. So where did life take you then, uh, once you become a Baha'i and you're a student? Uh, were you getting well, your master's degree at that time in no, clinical no, psychology? No, no, getting, I was getting an undergraduate degree then. Okay. And uh, so I became a Baha'i during my freshman year. Hmm. So as a young student, I was very also very privileged to uh, be under the sort of guidance of the Amherst Local Spiritual Assembly, many of whom were either students, graduate students or faculty members, but who were really alert to a possible uh, potential of individuals to really serve, who had the enthusiasm and the interest. And so they made it a point to sort of identify those people and really uh, give them unusual opportunities so I was privileged to be among them. For example, there was a man whose name is Hassan Sabri. Some of you may remember him. Hassan Sabri was a uh, resident in Africa. And he was on the Continental Pioneer Committee in Africa. So he periodically would make trips around the world. And that year he came to Amherst to really encourage people to go pioneering to Africa. And because I was a young kid, a brand new freshman student, new Baha'i, and he decided that you know, he asked if I was going to Greenacre because every year when he came, he would go take, make time to go to Greenacre. That year he couldn't. So he asked me if I would be his uh, deputy. In other words, go on his behalf. Mm, mm-hmm. So, you know, his strategy, I'm sure, was, oh, here's somebody that I could maybe assist in some way. And I didn't have the resources. So he actually left the money with the local assembly for me to go. Beautiful. And the assembly told me that after he had left, that I was to go on his behalf, the expenses would be paid, and that I was to write and document my experiences for him. Mm. 
the time that they selected for me to go was the time when the hand of the cause, Mr. Kadem, was there. Mm. So that was a, tr- you see, a, what a gift. So, you know, my first meeting of a hand of the cause was Mr. Kadem, who grabbed me when he met me and kissed me on both eyes, which frightened me because I'm not, was not used to some <laughs> dude. Kissing you on the eyes. <laughs> kissing me in my eyes. I mean, yeah. you know, kissing me, period. And that's that's what vampires do, I think. That's right. So, but, you know, it was a tremendous experience in learning. Or they also sent me to, in the middle of the winter, the following winter to Bolac, which was the Canadian Baha'i Winter School. It's in the Laurentian Mountains. It was a rustic camp. And I had the experience to be there and to meet many souls from that community as well and uh, learned a tremendous amount. Uh, and one person in particular that I remember, his name was Emmerich Sala. He was married to a, a woman named Rosemary, who I remember had recently been to the World Center, collected these petals from the the thresholds, and she was sewing them into bookmarks. In fact, I have one here, someplace in one of my books, where she literally just sewed these petals into a little ribbon for a bookmark. Mm. And she spent the whole week doing this, you know, and just telling encouraging stories. Emmerich was Hungarian, very gruff kind of guy, you know, who was very um, curt in his remarks, but he had such a heart of gold. Um, Mm. And I'll always treasure the fact that, you know, as a kid from Roxbury in Boston, we never had, lived in the projects, we never had fireplaces. He taught me how to build a fire in a fireplace. Mm. Mm. So that's a practical skill given to somebody in a, in a spiritual uh, uh, manner, which was really something. What crazy. ignited your heart about the faith during that time? Was there a specific teaching or was it, uh, was it a feeling? Did you have a mystical experience of some kind? Was there a specific writing that really turned you on? Well, if you remember the time, many of us, and I was very much uh, uh, involved with the Pan-Africanist movement, But for many of us, you know, we used to say we traded in Mao's Red Book for Advent of Divine Justice. (laughs) Okay, you know, so many of us were thinking in in these sort of revolutionary terms, wanting to change the society and seeing the need for it. Wow. And that wasn't reserved for those of us who were just Baha'is. It was just really the whole generation of people. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, once we heard about the faith and we started reading uh, Shoghi Effendi and and the advent of divine justice and and other materials that really helped to stimulate us and provided us with a, a vision that uh, that was was possible was realistic yeah I, and I, something that we embraced I, I love that I hadn't really heard that before but that idea that you wanted revolution you wanted to change the world absolutely but shifting absolutely. from a political uh, solution to a spiritual one but taking exactly. that same fervor and just turning a corner with it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and again, this collection of, of young people uh, who were together. I mean, together we would do things like we would go to, uh, you know, in our leisure time, go and read writing, the, the writings together and pray together. Or we would have these intense discussions together about what, it, what these various passages we were reading meant. Uh, it's a very, very dynamic period. You know, mm, mm. very, very, very special. Mm. So, what do you think Baha'is today could learn from those times? I actually think those same kinds of discussions can exist today and do to some degree. I mean, now I think in study circles, some of that discussion emerges, you know, and uh, there are now sort of, uh, you know, groups of people who are getting together, especially given the current environment that we live in, you know, we're seeing these different challenges that emerge, uh, uh, how people are th- sort of thinking about having elevated conversation yep. and talking about these, these particular concerns and reframing them in, 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 with, uh, uh, from political solutions to spiritual so- solutions mm-hmm. and taking the long view, thinking not about the immediate, but also what's beyond the immediate. No, and I, th- I think a lot of people are beginning to, to do that. And, and look, in the society in general, not just the Baha'i community, 
uh, people, particularly younger people now, are saying, hey, look, this is not going to be okay the way things are. Mm-hmm. We've got to do something that's, that, that makes a difference, be it about race, uh, be it about the dynamics with women, be it, you know, and the challenges that women face, be it about uh, the environment. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And you, you, you have these kinds of uh, concerns being expressed and looked at. And I think more and more we see or hear how people are bringing what the revelation of Baha'u'llah has to offer to those discussions and think about, okay, what, what, how do these things, these themes apply? Mm-hmm. And I think also the guidance of the House of Justice, this idea of community building, is not just some sort of a, a separated, separated notion, but is one that can be used to integrate concerns, heartfelt concerns of people about their own condition, but also the condition of others into a, a sort of process where change can occur. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about now making making the faith really uh, uh, applicable, you know, mm-hmm. not, not just something over there, but something that applies to all of us, mm-hmm. regardless of whether we have accepted Baha'u'llah as, uh, and become members of the Baha'i faith, or if we just see it as valuable, a valuable resource in, in changing our life situation. Mm, mm. Now, I was going to ask you about the, the various administrative roles that you've played in the faith, which I find fascinating. I'm not bringing these up to, you know, to ring a bell for you or, or anything like that. But one of the questions I have for you is yeah, yeah. some people find serving in administrations like that kind of stultifying. And difficult, and there's often a complaint in the Baha'i community that Baha'is come in with a great amount of passion and vigor, and and then they're put on committees, and they've never been on a committee before, and they have to learn how to take minutes and delegate and coordinate and communicate. And did you struggle with that at all, or what would you say about that bounty of serving in these various capacities and what you learned about the Baha'i administrative structure? I know that's a very Broad question. Well, uh, that's a that's a very good question. I think um, I've had a, the great privilege of serving in these many of these institutions, but somehow I, I just I guess I just didn't get it right because they kept moving me, <laughs> moving you around. <laughs> you know, first of all, service on these institutions is a duty for the most for the most part. You know, so one is called to service and. You have to see it as a duty as opposed to uh, something that, you know, nobody raises their hand and says, vote for me. You know, Mm -hmm, I mean, that's just mm -hmm. not what we do. Nobody raises their hand and says, oh, appoint me as an auxiliary board member, you know, because that would be the last person you would want to serve in these roles. Mm -hmm. Um, Because there is a lot of sacrifice, a lot of giving up of, you know, the things that you would sort of normally do. Um, Instead of know, watching the, a basketball game on a Thursday listen, night, you got to be that's right. four that's right. For hours years, a, for years meeting. in my little house, I never cleaned gutters, you know, because I was always gone someplace. That meant that I was also away from my family, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, it was a lot of giving up. But, you know, you do that in, when you love Baha'u'llah, you do, you do these kinds of things. But I also think that, uh, you know, your notion about it's what's the word you use? Stultifying. I, mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure what that means, but I think uh, it, I don't even know what it means. I think it's like sucks the energy out and is um, soul crushing. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Well, see, my experience is quite different, and that mm-hmm. is in part because I served in those institutions. I saw a broad range of things and people. I could really witness firsthand what contributions people were making, what strides people were making. Mm-hmm. And so, and I had the, the, the great opportunity to, to celebrate those, you know, because often I find then and now, when you live or operate in a certain sort of realm, you always think, oh, we could be doing more. Oh, we're not doing enough. Oh, we're not having much success. But then when somebody from the outside has a view of it and they can compare it to other things, Mm -hmm. they can really give you a more um, accurate assessment of the progress that you're making. Mm -hmm. Because, look, if if we look in the mirror, we see all of our imperfections. Mm -hmm. I mean, all, you know, I can tell you all of my warts and all of my problems and all of my, you know, inadequacies. But I have no idea 
how much I'm really doing unless somebody from someplace else can give me some perspective. Mm. Mm. And so that's a great benefit to be able to do that. So I felt very fortunate to have that. And then to do it as an auxiliary board member, you see, now you're traveling through regions of the country. And then as a continental counselor, to, to have a chance to do that throughout the whole hemisphere, you know, was really mm. quite extraordinary. Mm. Yes, it was hard work. It was exhausting. But what a bounty, what a blessing, mm. you know, it was. Mm. So, um, and I think the other thing is... Um, one learns to be detached from the kingdom of names mm. and to really focus on the service. Mm. Because it's whether you are named as a member of a board or as a counselor or even an NSA member, it's really the service that's more important, not so much the title. You know? mm. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's, that's beautiful. So when you're a, you're a therapist and being a therapist and a counselor, how was that influenced by what you learned as a Baha'i, how did your work and your faith kind of dovetail? Did someone comes into your room yes. and they're suffering from addiction or depression or yes. anxiety, marital problems. As a Baha'i, what is that like? They walk into the room and they're, and they're, you're, you're developing a relationship, a rapport with them. They're telling you their issues. How do you take the, the, the teachings of Abdul Baha and Baha'u'llah and apply them uh, in that professional context? Well, first of all, uh, those I have had this question very often, and that is Baha'is will say, I think I need a therapist, I need a Baha'i therapist. And my response is, what you need is a good therapist. Mm. Rather, you know, not it, just because somebody's a Baha'i doesn't mean they're a good therapist. Mm -hmm. Okay? So yep. what you need is a good therapist, Okay. <laughs> Because a, a therapist is in, uh, an instrument to assist you in sorting out the challenges that you face. Uh, and a good therapist does not impose his or her um, notions about right and wrong on mm -hmm. his or her client or patient. Right, so okay. if there's an atheist therapist or a Roman Catholic Doesn't therapist, make a, difference. a good if one good, should not have an agenda. That's right. If they're you. good, they, they are there to help you. And it's your business to sort out. Mm. Okay? So there's that. The other thing in the House of Justice, I think, is talking to the Baha'i community and trying to help us to really understand more and more that there are right things in this world that we can pay attention to. So if there is truth, truth is truth. Okay? So you don't have to label it as Baha'i or, or non-Baha'i or this or that. It is truth. Mm -hmm. And what the revelation of Baha'u'llah can give you is a way to frame that truth, okay? So, you know, if you position yourself as a helper and you say, well, the Baha'i teachings say this, okay, then it can feel like an imposition. But however, if it's a truth, then you might be able to frame that truth and say, an experience one could have would be this or that, okay? Mm -hmm. So... I think for me, there was a freedom to be able to share those things that were sort of clear to me as valued gems for others' lives that would help them. But it wasn't necessarily me trying to convert somebody. Sure. So, you know, again, truth is truth. And wherever you find it, if it rings, if it rings, if it has that ring, then it's, it's useful, yeah. valuable, helpful. I've, therapy has been very invaluable to me. It's been super helpful in my life. I've been in it for many years. My, um, it's helped my marriage and it's helped my career. It's helped my spiritual journey. It's helped me overcome incredible uh, difficulties and uh, gain really great perspective. But I find often in the Baha'i community, there's a, a kind of a, a reactivity almost against psychology and there seems to be, and I don't know if it's a cultural thing. I don't know if it's a, it's a, if it's like a 1950s Western cultural thing or a Persian cultural thing or something, but some idea that, well, Baha'is don't need therapy or they shouldn't need therapy. All the answers can be found in the writings. I've had relatives tell me this. Well, I don't need therapy. It's all in the writings. I just need to read the hidden words more and get more in touch with the, 
with the writings and that I don't really, and, and there's also that was, someone once mentioned to me that the prohibition against confession and they view like therapy as like confession, although confession has that, that element of like absolving one of one's yes, sins, yes, you know, that's yes, the point yes. of it. And the confessional element in, in, in psychology and in therapy is simply to get to know yourself better. Doesn't the Quran say, and Baha'u'llah quotes the Quran and saying to know God is to know thyself. So in knowing ourselves better, we get to know God better because we get to know how we operate. Um, so I'd, lo- I'd love your thoughts on, on that. Well, I, I'm, first of all, I, I'm glad you're able to say so clearly and openly you know, that therapy has been valuable and useful. And it, I don't think you or anybody is saying everybody should be in therapy. That's not it, okay? Mm-hmm. But if there, is a, if there is a challenge that we're facing, why not access the support? Baha'u'llah does say, look, turn to experts if you have a need. If you had a, an illness you're going to turn to an expert to figure out what this illness is and how to how to you know how to how to change it or if it's not just an illness okay but it's maybe you you just have you're confused about something you turn to 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 get some help so i think a lot of times you know uh, people have been reared to think that it's a weakness to admit mm. that one might need help when when in fact we all need help at some point in our lives no matter who we are, there is no one who doesn't need an assist. And so therapists are not there to somehow make you different than you are. It's to help you sort of work through those challenges that you might face. You know, and it's very helpful. And then, for God's sake, use it. You know, get some help for yourself and then move on. You know, in other words, sometimes our wings are not quite strong enough. We need to develop them. You need somebody to give you the, the, the tools to exercise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay? So you exercise and then you can fly. Oh, good. You know? So uh, I don't know where, where this notion, and I don't think it's just within the Baha'i community. Certain cultures also mm-hmm. have labeled it somehow. Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned marriage, for example. Marriage is not easy for no. everybody. No, sir. You know, it's just not. And so... There are certain things that we have to learn, you know, that we may not realize about ourselves. And if we're with somebody that we want to be with, but yet somehow things aren't, you know, sort of, they're not going well, why not have the opportunity to sit down and talk them through with somebody who can reflect back what those challenges might be and give us some possible solutions? Then it can work out. Thank thank you, you know, for that. Right. And also, uh, Billy, I think that, you know, we spend, as human beings in our culture, we spend this amount of time um, shopping, we spend a certain amount of time in our entertainment, we spend a certain amount of time exercising our physical bodies. Can we spend one hour a week, one hour every other week, just one hour, 50 minutes, like examining ourselves and learning about ourselves? I think that's another perspective because that's that's really all it is yeah and I, but but i also think that therapy in this culture has been identified as an elitist experience mm. only those people who have the resources you know it's for the wealthy mm. who can leisurely at cocktail hours talk about their therapists, <laughs> you know, that's how it's that's how it's sort of framed in, mm. in in the larger society. And poor people generally don't have access. Mm. That's changing. But for people who are at the middle class and lower middle class and beyond, uh, their access has to be an emergency. Mm. Yeah, and it's not integrated into the possibilities of of life because of cost and all that kind of thing. In other countries where medicine is different and they paid for it, it's orchestrated as more normal. So, you know, I mean, I think these are things that we have to just over time overcome. Right. So there's, I, a, there's uh, a social injustice inherent at the, at the root of, of ab- absolutely. psychology yeah. and the need for psychology. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And as a, for me as a, a man of color, I mean, I'm, look, the, the number of, of clients that came to my office when they saw me turned around and walked out was astounding. 
Wow. You know, because they just thought, oh, no, I, how could you help me? You don't you could never understand my experience. Hmm. But but, uh, you know, a lot of that's changing now, you know, but the same thing, the society is changing. Th- thank goodness. Hmm. Well, I think we're going to see a change with that as well. Oh, great. Let's fast forward a little bit to the black men's gathering. Uh, for those of listeners that aren't familiar with with that group, with that movement, can you tell us a little bit about it and what it is, what it did, why you founded it, how you founded it? Well, okay, so here I am, a young man, a young African-American man who's a Baha'i, who wants to serve the faith, and I looked around in the national community, and I kept thinking, well, gee, there are not many men of African descent visible. How come? And I looked around and saw that there were many more women of African descent who were visible at that time. And I started asking the question, why? And as I talked to people, I realized that there was a need for some intervention to really look at this. So I just independently called to get, I was an auxiliary board member then, I and, but I uh, just independently decided I would invite a few people that I knew to come together or had knew or knew about to come together to spend a weekend consulting about it. Mm. And we chose Greensboro, North Carolina, not for any other reason. So it had nothing to do with the civil rights history, because, you know, that was the seat of, you know, the the lunch counters and all that kind of business. But that wasn't the reason. The reason was they opened a brand new airport there and they were they had cheap tickets <laughs> to get there. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, that was very practical, mm-hmm. okay? And we met in a residence inn, okay? Uh, because we didn't have a lot of money. I mean, nobody there wasn't there wasn't any institutional uh, sponsoring of this. It was just individuals. And so these gentlemen decided they'd come at my invitation. Everybody didn't accept the invitation, but those who did came. And uh, we spent that weekend really thinking together and praying together and consulting about these dynamics. And out of that grew um, an extraordinary experience where we found we needed to have that time together. And so we then decided we would meet again. And the following meeting we decided to have at the Lewis Gregory Institute. And the reason we chose to meet there was because the Institute, the Lewis Gregory Institute at that time was having what was called Youth Academy. And there were a large number, a large contingent of, of young black Baha'i kids coming from South Carolina who were there, who we felt would benefit from uh, witnessing and being in the presence of older black men mm. who were Baha'is. Mm. And that evolved again into the next stage. So really over the 25 years of the gathering, uh, it wasn't that it was completely conceptualized at the beginning. It evolved and grew in our understanding and in our experience. And then we were in direct touch from the very beginning with the House of Justice, who continually from the very beginning reinforced it. Also, the National Spiritual Assembly continually encouraged it and reinforced it. So we took the guidance from the House of Justice and from the National Assembly and incorporated that into our thinking and our planning. To the point where literally thousands of men of African descent came to that, not only from the U.S., but from other countries in the world. And began to really focus on what the contributions of African Americans needed to be to help to develop the faith and and, uh, uh, and to serve the faith. In, I believe it was 1996, the House of Justice made a call to people all over the world in its Rizwan message. And then they sent specific messages to set different regions of the world. Mm -hmm. To the United States, they sent a message and they wrote uh, to various populations. To the people of African descent, they called on those individuals 
to go as travel teachers and pioneers to Africa. To the indigenous peoples, they called to go to the circumpolar regions. To people of Latin descent, they called on to t- travel teach and pioneer to, to Latin America, etc. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. So the Black Men's Gathering, we consulted about it, and we decided that we would go travel teaching to various parts of the continent. We started with Southern Africa. The next year was in West Africa, and we sent contingents of, of men who went in teams to various countries in each one of those regions, including East Africa and Central Africa. And then the final, one final year we sent to all the regions in Africa at the same time. I think some 54 went or something like that at one Mm. time. Mm. And then it followed on with trips to parts of South America as well as to the Caribbean. Mm. And it was a quite an amazing experience for all of them. You know, some of these gentlemen received support from their local assemblies to assist them with the cost of going. Mm. Many worked second jobs to raise the funds to go. But what is for certain is the experience of those journeys. And they were not tourist trips, okay? And we didn't stay in fancy hotels. And we really went to some of the most far-reaching parts of the continent and lived with the people that we were visiting as their guests and ate what they ate and served alongside them. The House of Justice called on us, in their words, to be a source of encouragement and inspiration to the African believers who were on the verge of great victories. Mm. So it wasn't about us, and it wasn't about what we could do, except to provide encouragement and to be an example of what was possible. Mm. 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 And uh, and we could witness that when wherever we went. So there are many, many stories that that. Uh, well, give us one. What's uh, what's the? Give us a plum story of that. I think that's so beautiful. Thinking about dozens of African American men setting out across Africa to inspire and uplift and encourage. But uh, do any stories come to heart? Okay. All right. So I was just telling somebody this story the other day because uh, a friend of mine, Cam Hearth, is uh, now about to uh, become. I think he's he's going to be the administrator for the Lou Helen Baha'i School. And Cam Hearth is from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Mm-hmm. Cam Hearth has not done a lot of travel in his life. So he, he was on this trip with a gathering to West Africa. And of the 20 or so men that were on that trip, he was assigned to a team that went to Ghana and also to Cameroon. Now... There were five of us in that group. So we go to Ghana. We arrive in Ghana, uh, and we meet with the National Spiritual Assembly. And the National Spiritual Assembly there decided that we should stay in Accra because it was too challenging to go to more rural areas. So in that consultation, I boldly spoke to the National Assembly respectfully, of course, and said, the House of Justice has called on us to visit the African believers to do these things. I'm quoting from the House of Justice. And I said, you know, um, the people in Accra have seen visitors. But what about the rural areas, you know? And uh, would you consider, and they said, well, we think it's too dangerous. It's too, the roads are not, it's too hard. And we don't think that you could do that. And I said, would you please pray and consult about it? So they excused us from the room. Cam (laughs) looked at me, and he was very, Cam is a wonderful guy, but he usually is very reserved. And he said something like, what is wrong with you? They said stay in Accra. (laughs) Why Why we got to go way out to some rural area and sleep out there, you know? (laughs) And I said, look, let's agree that whatever the National Assembly decides, we'll do. Okay, respectfully do, wholeheartedly. Uh, Even though we wanted different things, you know, we could, our vision was different. Well, we came back in and the National Assembly decided that we should go to the Volta region, which is a very, a hard journey. And they were going to send one of its own members with us. 
we would have to rent an all-terrain vehicle, which we said we would gladly do. And we would have to stay out there for a period of time. And it was not easy. And the roads were rough. And it was a real challenge. It was a real test. And when we got out there, I mean, I'll give you one story. When we got out there to bathe, you know, they said, oh, let's put a cap full of this disinfectant in the bucket of water because that's what you bathe with, the bucket of water. And uh, one of the guys who was with us, his name is Bruce Reynolds, you know, he he didn't realize it was a cap full. He thought it was a cup full. So he poured <laughs> a, a cup full of disinfectant in this water and then bathed with it. And you could hear him squealing because of the stinging. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I'm just shortening the story, but Cam's vision of himself as a Baha'i and his vision of that service shifted dramatically because he then saw and was in touch with people who really were interested in what he had to say and really learned from him, and he learned from them. And it also bonded all of our hearts, because when you do that kind of service, you know, you you fall in love with one another in a different kind of way, Hmm. you know, because you're doing it really not for yourself, but you're doing it really as a service to God. Hmm. So, I mean, maybe that's the, not the most exciting story. I mean, there are many others, but I mean, that's the one that comes to mind. Hmm. Uh, Hmm. To this day, those people who were on that in that team, we still have a tremendously close bond, mm. really, uh, and um, and it really is because we had that experience on the ground together. What did you learn from the Baha'i communities of Africa? I mean, it's a huge continent, so obviously that's a every place giant is different. generalization. Right. There are many, many countries, different cultures. But I can say, first of all, every person that went on those journeys can say that they learned more than they were able to contribute or give. They received more. I think, secondly, you learn the African diaspora is not a homogeneous entity, Mm -hmm. that the diversity is extraordinary, Mm. and that you learn that your notions about different peoples and their capacity is not defined in material terms. Hmm. So because somebody doesn't have certain degrees does not mean that they aren't competent. So, for example, I can remember in one village a woman was trusted to be, she had no education, but she was entrusted to be essentially the community banker. Everybody trusted this woman with their money. What little money they had, they entrusted it to her. She held on to it, and she would actually do all, really what we would call microloans now. Hmm. So somebody would come, and they'd say, well, I need such and such for this, and she'd make a decision, and she'd extend it to them, and then they would pay her back. And they dare not because they didn't want to lose her trust. And in this instance, she was a Baha'i. Now, they're not all Baha'is, but in this instance, she was a Baha'i, you see? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, when you see something like that, that's not something that is normally witnessed in this society, you know? Mm. Those people who have the, 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 who are entrusted with these kinds of responsibilities are also have degrees and are, you know, you know, of the certain, certain ilk, if you mm-hmm. will. Mm-hmm. One of the things I really admire about you, Billy, is your ability to find so much balance, uh, balance in your work life and your faith life, um, and also this balance between your identity as uh, a black male in America, uh, in in a deeply prejudiced and unjust country and system, and you're balancing that identity with your Baha'i identity, which is a child of God, uh, you know, a beautiful, luminous soul and a world citizen. So maybe we can talk about these kind of balances. How do you start with that second part of that question? How have you found that balance in these two aspects of your identity? This is a really uh, a, a deep, thought-provoking question, I think. First of all, the, the faith of Baha'u'llah affirms your identity. It affirms my identity. And an example is that uh, we believe 
that there will be a universal auxiliary language that will be spoken in addition to one's mother tongue. Let's just use that as an example, which is an affirmation of one's individual culture. Mm. Uh, notwithstanding the opportunity and need for a universal language that facilitates communication with everybody. But it's not done, that universal language is not meant to obliterate or eliminate one's mother tongue. Mm. I think the same thing with individual cultures. Each culture has something very special to contribute to the world civilization. And I think we have to recognize that and appreciate and honor that. Uh, and so for me I as a man... I think for white culture, that was casseroles. You know, um, casseroles are wonderful. They have a, a, a very important function. That's, that's our contribution. You know, if You're you welcome, wanna, world. It, yes, but you know, I think you should be careful not to be um, derogatory about any culture. Mm-hmm. Because every culture has something very special to contribute. Mm. And it's not easy for me to just sort of sit and hear anyone sort of denigrate any, any particular group. I, I understand it may be a joke and all that kind of thing, but I, I caution you because, uh, look, whether we, whether we uh, fully appreciate it or not, even casseroles, look, at potlucks are essential. Because what would we do without them? I know. What would we do without them? Really, when you think about it, okay? So different cultures have lots to offer. And, uh, and so what we have to do is, in our own experience, to affirm who we are and what contributions we can make. Hmm. Which also means that I can affirm the fact that I'm a man of African descent, that I'm a black man living in America, and that I've, I've endured and continue to adore certain challenges, but in spite of those, I am not going to deny who I am and what I'm all about. Mm. Because I know that what I have and what I am is something very important to contribute to the world civilization. And without it, that world civilization is going to suffer. Mm. That's beautiful. Okay? And the same thing with any person who's of, of, of European background, or of Latino background, of Asian background, whatever. Everybody has something to contribute, and we all need it. And the truth is, I'm, I don't want to be banging so much because I'm, to make the point, but I, I, I just think that we have to learn to celebrate the benefits of every culture and expect and anticipate others to celebrate ours as well. Mm-hmm. And the only way you can do that is to stand up and be exactly who you are and not try to pretend that you're not. Mm. Mm. So, you know, I know that in some situations there are some people who may feel like, uh, you know, they're not, uh, it would be better if uh, uh, they weren't seen so much together. You know, there's a certain time in history when, Black people felt that they couldn't congregate together, couldn't be together because it was threatening to other people or people were suspicious of it. You know, and I say, look, get over that. There's nothing wrong with being friends with people who look like you. Okay? Yeah. And all doesn't mean with, you know, every year I, I, I sort of have a fishing trip, okay? Guys come to uh, where I live and we go out fishing, you know? And it's a guy trip, you know? And, you know, that means, you know, not that women couldn't go fishing, but it tends to be, you know, we all where we sleep and we just sleep in what do you call it, uh, blow up beds and what have you. So it's a guy trip. Guys go. They're from all kinds of backgrounds, and so you have some people who are speaking in different languages, and you have people who are, you know, older and people who are younger, and people, you know, tell sort of raunchy jokes, and people who are, you know, I mean, so it's just a whole thing. Uh huh. But people are just having fun. Mm. You know, mm. and they're learning to be together, you know, and learning that everybody has something to contribute mm. and to, uh, to one another's lives. And I think we just have to do more of that. So when you ask me, okay, how do I manage? It is the first thing is self-affirmation and recognizing 
that it's not just me, but people like me have something important to contribute. Mm. And that we can offer our share, our flavor to an experience, but that does not mean that it denies somebody else's offering their flavor. In other words, it's not either or, it's both. I think that's that's so beautiful. I've never heard it put that way. And, you know, you think about this flower garden of humanity and the whole point of Baha'u'llah is you're exactly right. It's not to make one flower, not to have a garden that's filled with the same oh, flower, yes. but the beauty and vitality of all of these different diverse flowers. So continuing on this about the African-American community, one thing we've learned at Baha'i Blog is that this blog is listened to worldwide. So people are yes. listening right now in in Madagascar and in India and Mongolia and Italy and you name it. So I, as an American, know the incredible achievement of the African-American community and what it's given to the world. But I would love to hear from you, like, what has the African-American community given the world? Not just, of course, through the incredible arts and, and writing and brilliance, but also spiritually. And what can the world take from the African-American community? community? What spiritual lessons? Yeah, you know, uh, well, first of all, I think, yes, every uh, community has made its contributions to um, the, the world of the spirit. And those learnings are derived from their history and their, 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 um, their sufferings and their um, desire to move from where they are forward. And so for the African-American community, you know, this is a, a population that has endured great suffering, really, just incredible suffering, you know, the history of it. So as a member of that community, okay, I can tell you that in spite of all the suffering, we have had to find joy. Hmm. And, and part of the joy is learning how to fall in love with one another and to tease one another, and to um, <laughs> really, you know, uh, see one another not by the roles that we play in society, but by our, by our own character. Mm. So, you know, for example, you know, someone who may have at a certain point in their life been a service worker or a maid or, or someone, you know, who provides that kind of level of service, which in this society is seen at the bottom rung, mm. okay, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that same person who slaved all week, who worked all week in those kinds, in that toil, okay, on Sunday, dressed up to go to church, okay, with a, a big beautiful hat as a crown and beautiful clothes, and so you don't define that person as simply, you know, that in that way. You define them in a different way. And so we've learned to see people in, you know, uh, and honor them, not for what they do, but who they are, what their characters are. So this is something that is valuable to people all over the world. How can a people who've suffered so much somehow rise above that? You see? Mm. Yeah. How can a people who facing, um, you know, historical uh, deprivation and prejudice uh, have, have a vision of their children doing better, you know, yeah. and realizing that, you see? Yeah. So this is something that I think can be inspirational to people all over the world. So other groups of people in different parts of the world who are subjugated, who feel that kind of oppression can see, oh, it is possible to emerge from that condition and to, be, to, make, to, to become leaders in your society. Mm. Mm. You see, it yeah. is possible. Yeah. You know? And it doesn't happen overnight. This is the other thing, patience, mm. endurance. You know? I mean, I think there's a quotation I like it, that Shoghi Effendi makes. He says, it is with spirit, determination, and sacrifice that victories come one after the other. It is with spirit, determination, and sacrifice mm. that victories come one after the other. Mm. Now, that applies to every person of every background, you know, and if we think of and reflect on that, the spirit, the determination, and the sacrifice will bring victories. Mm. 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 So, that's beautiful. 
I, I uh, really, uh, it's not a simple topic. You know, I don't want anybody to think that these simple ideas, you know, okay, that's that's it. Because the depth of uh, uh, the impact on peoples is really quite significant. You know, uh, and there are many people who are uh, impacted by it, this, this, this history, in devastating ways. Mm. They tur- people turn on one another. Uh, you know, those things that, uh, you know, you, you think un- are unimaginable, people mm. do. But in, a, in fact, they do it as a result of the rage that they feel, you know, and sometimes they, that rage gets turned on yourself or it gets turned on your m- members of your own community. Comes out know? sideways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's just emerge. It's just coming. So we have to learn how to how to manage through that, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, and over time, I think this will come, you know. But we also need the help of everybody mm-hmm. to assist everybody and to begin to to celebrate the the, the capacity of everybody. So, mm. so not an easy. Thing. No, and I, I we, unfortunately we don't have the time to to really delve into it with the depth that yes, it's uh, yes. that it's required. But that's one of the, I will I will say this to you, Rain. One of the one of the themes of the Black Men's Gathering. Sometimes people think the black thought the, the black men's gathering was talking about white people and in a way that people anticipated when black people to get together, they must be talking about us, you know, <laughs> you know, well, I mean, I've had people say that. Uh-huh. And uh, I mean, I said, said this to one person who expressed vehemently and upset. Why, why do you think you have to have a meeting to talk about us in the Baha'i community? And I said, well, what makes you think you're that important? Yeah. I, I, that was a yeah. flippant, re, flippant remark. But I really wanted to make the point, look, it's not always about you, you see? Mm -hmm. In this case, the gathering was about black people finding ways to address their challenges and to do that which Baha'u'llah intended for us to do, Mm -hmm. make our contribution, just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. So the gathering, it wasn't about race unity, you know, it wasn't about, you know, being being uh, reactive to somebody else, but it was about a self-assessment to really figure out how we change our response and our condition to be able to do that which Baha'u'llah wants us to do, to mm. serve him. Mm. Yeah. We had spoken before just a little bit, and I wanted to go back to this topic about um, finding that balance between your work and your service life, your faith life. It's something I know a lot of Baha'is struggle with. Uh, you had talked about periods of time in which you your faith was more uh, given a higher priority than your work life, and other times when your work life needed to take, or your family life needed to take a higher priority. Do you have any thoughts on that issue? I, I think this is something that many, many people have to um, struggle with, and that is this idea of balance. Uh, someone once defined balance as constant motion mm, mm-hmm. you know to keep the balance to do mm-hmm. this side and this side and this side and this side the scales you know, are always moving back and always forth. moving mm-hmm. always moving exactly you know and and then that would be balance and sometimes you do more on this side and then less on that side and then vice versa you know mm-hmm. so I, I do think that what we have to figure out is in for each one of us individually is, how to somehow incorporate everything at once. In other words, not to say, well, for this week, I'm going to just do my job, and then next week I'll do do service, Mm -hmm. but somehow to work and do service simultaneously Mm. and to somehow make them supportive of one another, okay? Uh, To say... To say a prayer is not just to say a prayer in in the early morning, you know, and be done with it, but to be able to have a prayer on our lips throughout the day. Mm. In other words, to to have the vision of a prayer, mm-hmm. you know, to Abdul really. Abdu'l-Baha you know, says, "Strive day by day that your actions may be beautiful prayers." There you go. There you go. Yeah. So that you see, it's it and it becomes an integrated, you know, sort of process, and I think. Sometimes, you know, we think, well, you know, I really got to put in time to get my profession right. I mean, I was talking to my son-in-law about this, you know, and he's in graduate school and he's thinking, you know, 
I really miss because he was a very active Baha'ist in in doing service things. But he's he's not able to do that quite in the same way. And my point to him was, look, it, what is your prayer? Or when you're thinking about your work, how is it going to serve mankind? Mm. You see, how can you, in your interactions with your fellow students or with your faculty members, elevate, have spiritual conversations? I mean, now you're, that's integration, you see, mm, mm, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, so it becomes, it becomes a consolidated whole and you're not, you yourself don't feel fragmented. Right. I love that, that idea of integration. I, I find, you know, that Abdu'l-Bahá quote, you know, little by little, Bit by bit, yes, yes, um, yes. how one grows spiritually, and um, yes, you know, yes. if you do that simply with a schedule, I've found in my life that you know, early on, as I became reactivated as a Baha'i, like doing one meeting a month plus like a feast was like more than I could possibly imagine. Yes. I was like, yes. oh my gosh, that's so much! I'm so busy. How can I possibly right. do that? And then you introduce a little bit more and then you maybe you start a ruhi class and then like okay That's monday right. nights i'm doing ruhi class i'm also on this committee that meets every two or three weeks and i go to feast okay okay that's right and then and then it's amazing how as you incorporate it and uh integrate your spiritual life and your spiritual service that you can take on more and more and more yes and yeah. then you find that your schedule can all of a sudden allow a junior youth group here and a Ruhi group here and an assembly meeting here and service mm -hmm. on the weekends here and, and a summer school here. And you don't feel overburdened, but you yes. do have to take it on gradually. Gradually. Irene, I think the other thing is, look, stay grounded. Don't allow whatever you're doing to make you think that you're better than, but stay grounded. There's a Persian saying, you know, uh, I, I won't say it in, in Farsi, but it is that there's a prayer, oh Lord, make me a tiny grass. Because when the winds of sedition blow, it's the tall trees that fall, but the tiny grasses remain firm. Mm. Mm. You see? So if we remain close to the ground and mm. we keep ourselves humble, no matter what roles we play in the society, you know, the hand of Claus Lewis Gregory used to have this expression, and he said the master, I, he attributed it to the master. And he said, praise is wonderful as long as you don't inhale it. <laughs> I, I love this, you know, because it's, it's praise is wonderful for the receiver, the recipient. It's wonderful for the giver. But that shouldn't be inhaled mm. because then that takes you to a different space. Right, right. You see, mm -hmm. be humble, be the one of those tiny grasses. Mm -hmm. And no matter what, you'll be able to contribute more. The prospects of your life will evolve and grow, you mm, see? That's great. So, anyway. That's great. Yeah. Now, do you have a favorite quote that you wanted to share with us? You know, I have, many, I have many quotes that are favorites, I tell you. And just thinking about this, I thought, well, if I were to share a quote currently, what would it be? So it's this one, okay? This is a quotation of Baha'u'llah. And you can find it in the compilation of compilations. Mm -hmm. And it's from a tablet translated from the Persian, and it's, it, it's this. Whatever occurreth in the world of being is light for his loved ones and fire for the people of sedition and strife. Even if all the losses of the world were to be sustained by one of the friends of God, he would still profit thereby. Whereas true loss would be borne by such as are wayward, ignorant and contemptuous. Although the author of the following saying had intended it otherwise, yet we find it pertinent to the operation of God's immutable will. This is Baha'u'llah speaking, and here's mm. the quote. Even or odd, thou shalt win the wager. Even or odd, thou shalt win the wager. Mm. And then Baha'u'llah goes on, the friends of God shall win and profit under all conditions and shall attain true wealth. In fire, they remain cold, and from water, they emerge dry. Their affairs are at variance with the affairs of men. 
Gain is their lot, whatever the deal. To this testifieth every wise one with a discerning eye and every fair-minded one with a hearing ear. So even or odd, thou shalt win the wager. No matter what, if our focus is is appropriate, we're going to be fine. Mm. I just love that, Mm. you know? Mm. And it just gives me a sense of relief that, you know, because sometimes we think, oh, God, I got to make this decision. I don't know what to do. You know, Mm. I don't want to do the wrong thing. You know, even or odd. And look, life changes. Sometimes we have, you know, great fortunes and sometimes not. Even or odd, we can be okay if your focus is proper. That reminds me of that Buddhist teaching about the wheel and the karmic wheel. And the the wheel turns, Ah. the wheel goes up or the wheel goes down. Sometimes you're coming up and then it's spinning around and it's going up. That's right. And if you're you're attached to that wheel, then you're noticing the ups and downs. That's right. uh, It's a a, a non-attachment to that wheel of life. Yeah. Uh, so even our odd, thou shalt win the wager. There you go. Well, <laughs> this uh, was a great conversation. Thank you so much for your time, Billy. And Rain, uh, thank you, thank you. It's a uh, pleasure talking to you. It was it was an honor for me, really. And thank you for for your time and your wisdom and your stories. And I can't wait to to share this with the world. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much, and good night.